Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to the program this evening. My name is Greg Jenkins. I'm a professor at the Department of Meteorology and Atmospheric Sciences. I'm also the director of the Alliance for Education, Science, Engineering, and Design in Africa, MALFOR, otherwise known as ISEDA. Uh, my, my research largely focuses around Africa and the environment. Um, before we get started, I want to thank the sponsors, that's uh, the Institute for Energy and Environment, Environment and Energy, Energy and Environment, and uh, the Africana Research Center, and the So I'm going to just uh, give you a little background on the speakers, and then we'll go directly into the questions. And I will this to the halt if I can. Um, we have uh, Mike Mann, he's a distinguished professor of atmospheric sciences and meteorology and, and he's the director of the Earth System Science Center at Penn State. His research focuses on climate science and climate change. He made Bloomsburg list of 50 most influential people in 2013. He's authored more than 200 publications, he has four books. Two of them I'm using in the freshman seminar class. Um, <laughs> the Hockey Stick and the Climate Board, the Man Oss Effect, Dire Predictions, and the Tantrum to Save the World. Uh, Sridhar Anat Krishnan is a professor of geosciences in, with a joint appointment in Penn, in Penn State's College of Earth and Mineral Sciences and Earth and Environmental Systems Institute. He's a glaciologist, a seismologist, and an expert <coughs> ice sheet migration and Antarctic tectonics. His research focuses on polar regions of the Earth, including Antarctica and Greenland. Jenny Evans is a professor in the Department of Meteorology and Atmospheric Sciences, and she is the director of Penn State's Institute for Cyber Science. Um, the landfall of Tropical Cyclone Tracy in her home country of Australia in 1974 inspired her interest in hurricanes. Um, she is currently the president-elect of the American Meteorological Society. Her research focuses on climate change, tropical cyclones, numerical weather prediction, and tropical meteorology, and convective studies. And Dr. Warren Washington He's uh, recently retired from the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado. We're going to have a symposium for him tomorrow. Uh, he has engaged in research for more than 50 years and has given advice, testimony, and lectures on global climate change. Uh, he is a Penn State graduate, 1964, from the Department of Meteorology. He has served as a member of the, the President's National Academy Advisory Committee on Oceans and Atmosphere and has recently had presidential appointments under Presidents Carter, Reagan, Clinton, George W. Bush, and he served as an advisor for President Obama. Um, in 2010, Warren Washington was awarded the National Medal of Science by President Obama, the nation's highest science award. The citation for the award is for its development and use of climate models to understand climate and to explain the role of human activities and natural processes in Earth's climate system, and for his work for a diverse science and engineering workforce. So, I'm going to start out asking each of you questions. Um, by the way, this group is, I call them Earth, Wind, Fire, and Ice. <laughs> ice is the newest member on the end. <laughs> um, we're going to, I'm going to ask you some questions, each of you, and uh, at some point, we will go to the public. So we're going to spend about 40 minutes or so asking them specific questions about climate change. And then we'll take it out to you. I hope we'll have to figure out something with the mics, but uh, we'll work it out. So, I'm going to start out. Um, with Dr. Washington. So, Dr. Washington. You've been an innovator in the area of climate models that started more than 50 years ago. Can you tell us how models have evolved over time and why they are so important in telling us about the future in relationship to anthropogenic climate change? And in the back of you, I've got a depiction of a global climate model. 
Well, thank you, uh, Greg. Uh, clearly, in the early days of uh, planet modeling, uh, we were hampered by the lack of computer capability. So we had to simplify our models to uh, a, a, a level of simulating sort of a single day to a single day of computer time. So you had to be very patient. Now we can do uh, a very high resolution model and do uh, a century simu simulation in just just a few days of computer time. So we can really sort of do the research that we wanted to. Now what we had to do to get things started was to uh, sort of do it in a systematic way, first of all, development of atmospheric <coughs> models. And then uh, eventually coupling that to ocean models, and then to sea ice and vegetation models, and so forth. <clears throat> At our center in Boulder, Colorado, we have roughly 300 scientists involved, many of them from the universities, contributing to, to, to various aspects of the climate system. So the so that we meet sort of uh, twice a year and we try to figure out what are the next steps in making our models more credible and with fewer biases. <clears throat> and I can just tell you now that we are able to simulate virtually all of the major aspects of the climate system, in, including El Nino's, La Nina's, various other sort of very important features in the climate system. And, and we can then sort of ask the big question, what happens when you increase the, the uh, greenhouse gases, such as carbon dioxide, methane, and other greenhouse gases? And we can uh, simulate, starting with, say, 1880 temperatures, and go forward up until the present, and we can do a pretty good job of simulating the warming of the planet. And, and, and the, 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 the probably just as uh, important of an issue is, what is it going to happen in the future? And it turns out that if we wait until the, the last of the century, of this century, to <coughs> cut back on greenhouse gases, we're going to be dealing with a much different climate than we've ever, ever had in the past. And you will be hearing from the other speakers about various aspects of that. But I'll, I'll just sort of end there that we've, we've, we've achieved a lot of skill and, and, and have a, a much better idea of what we're likely if we don't cut back on the use of fossil fuels. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Evans, the next question is for you. <clears throat> Last year, you brought devastating hurricanes to Caribbean, to Puerto Rico, and to Houston. Is there a trend in powerful hurricanes that may be linked to anthropogenic climate change, or is this just part of some natural cycle? So I've got pictures of Harvey, <coughs> That's Houston. Here is Irma, another powerful hurricane. Uh, this is Barbuda, where most of the island is destroyed. And of course, this is Maria in the, the, the aftermath in Puerto Rico. So the hurricane season last year um, inspired a lot of research in my group. Uh, one of my students, Kelly, is from Puerto Rico, and so, of course, Maria was devastating in terms of her community. And uh, another of my, now my postdoc, Alex, has been studying Irma and Harvey. And the question that we're asking among all the specifics of those storms making landfall is, you know, are these systems particularly different? I have to say, I'm not going to say any individual storm 
is particularly the result of climate change, but I think we're ratcheting up the possibilities. Uh, I think that the warmer we become, and if we're not going to see a concomitant increase in the factors that tamp down the storms, the more likely it is that we're going to see more intense storms. So a tropical cyclone in the Atlantic and East Pacific, we call them a hurricane, relies on warm, moist energy from the ocean to drive it. Okay, so that's like the fuel for the car. And the clouds that make the ring around the center of the storm, the eyeball, are the engine that takes that moisture and turns it into wind, broadly speaking. And there are other things in the atmosphere that are going to tamp that engine down and make it work not quite as well. If the wind changes rapidly with height, that's one thing. If it hits land or if it goes over cold water, they will also tamp down that hurricane. What we're seeing is that that's happening less often. So those different, of course they're making landfalls, but the winds aren't doing the job that they may have done previously. So I think that that is making it more possible. And I think we also understand better, again, work by Alex Kowaleski, that it may be, we've known for a long time there's been a theory of how intense it is possible for a hurricane to get. And that work was begun by Kerry Emanuel in the 1980s. Recent work by Alex, um, we think that that's an underestimate. Okay, next question to Shrita. You work in these part of the world, but it's a nice world, right? Uh, we, most of us have never experienced it, maybe with the exception of Star Wars or something like that. Um, in Greenland and the Antarctic. Here's a picture from the South Pole. And I've heard through the grapevine that you and many other scientists around the world are taking important measurements in the Antarctic. Um, tell us exactly what's going on there, what you're doing, and then um, can you tell us what you're learning? Are there any things that we're learning about the Antarctic in particular? Uh, so the first thing I want to say is uh, that though uh, the Antarctic may be very far away, as is Greenland, uh, it is intimately connected uh, to the areas that any studies in the uh, tropical regions of the planet uh, or in the mid tropics or, or, or in the mid latitudes where we are here through sea level. Uh, so there is a one to one connection between uh, ocean, the, the size, the volume, the level of the ocean, and the size and volume of the ice sheets of Antarctica and Greenland because uh, when the ice melts in Antarctica, it has nowhere to go except into the oceans. And uh, uh, if there isn't a counterbalancing effect of removing water from the ocean by uh, uh, evaporation, then the net effect is to raise sea level. So that's the first thing I want to say is that even though maybe not quite so far away as the ice planet of Star Wars, uh, it, 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 they, they are far away, but they're not. Uh, not separate from us. Uh, what we do is we study um, the form, the shape, and the flow of the glaciers of Antarctica and Greenland. That's mainly where I've been working, uh, using both measurements, uh, direct measurements of the thickness and the, and the speed of, of, and the temperature of these glaciers, and using numerical models, as Dr. Warren uh, was saying. Um, these models are very useful, very important uh, for us to be able to uh, 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 kind of show what the glaciers look like today. And then we can ask questions if uh, temperature rises by half a degree or a degree, if the ocean changes temperature by half a degree or a degree, what happens uh, to the cycle that I was talking about of uh, Antarctic ice melting and going into the oceans and raising sea level. And our ability to do those models have gotten better, uh, but without good data, uh, we can't validate those models. Uh, obviously, for a lot of the atmospheric uh, modeling work, we can put out weather stations over here, 
and get those data and, and improve the models. In the Antarctic, the flow of the ice, in order to validate those models, we actually have to go there. You can only do so much with satellite measurements and, and aircraft. Uh, some of these measurements have to be taken uh, on the ground, if you will, on the ice. And, and so what we do is we go there and we measure the temperature, we measure the thickness, we measure the properties of the ice, we measure the properties of the rock beneath the ice, and then those things go into the models. Um, so what we found uh, is, uh, obviously, the global hydrologic the water system is very, very complex. Uh, but the ice uh, system is, is arguably somewhat less complicated than for example, things that Dr. Washington was referring to, having to include vegetation, having to include land use, and so on, because the Antarctic is isolated from a lot of those effects. So we've gotten better at, at, at modeling that. And uh, our concern in the years, in the next 50 years, 100 years, is that uh, there are parts of the Antarctic uh, that are poised to lose mass very, very, maybe poised to lose mass very rapidly, uh, as I said, over the next uh, uh, decades to a century, uh, resu resulting in the possible uh, sea level rise of many feet, not inches, but many feet, a uh, uh, meter or two meters, uh, which is three to six feet over the next century, which would be absolutely catastrophic for many coastal communities, uh, island uh, dwelling peoples, uh, and, and, and uh, really for everybody around the world. So uh, we're continually learning more about the Antarctic. Uh, it's one of the sources of largest uncertainty in projections going forward on what climate anthropogenic climate change will do to, uh, to these systems of, of sea level. And, and it's one that we have to continue to, to push on to, to get a better answer. Okay, thanks. <coughs> okay, Dr. Mann. Uh, last but not least. Okay. So, alias Professor Hockey Stick. This picture <laughs> behind you has caused lots of controversy. And it has also caused you some personal terms of people or groups actually coming after you. Can you tell us what is so important about this picture and why it's so troubling to some, some folks? Sure, thanks. Um, so the, the so-called hockey stick curve, um, and the name actually uh, was uh, given to this curve by uh, Jerry Malman, a colleague of ours uh, from the Princeton Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory, who himself was a premier uh, climate uh, researcher modeler. Um, and uh, because of the shape of the curve, uh, the handle uh, being the long descent from a thousand years ago into the depths of the Little Ice Age, and then the blade, of course, being the abrupt warming, that happens to coincide with uh, the industrial era. When we published this curve back in 1998, um, I didn't realize at the time that uh, my life would never be the same and this curve would take on a life of its own. Uh, it wasn't what I signed up for when I double majored in applied math and physics at UC Berkeley and went off to uh, Yale University to study physics and then eventually climate science. Little did I realize that I was uh, setting myself on a path uh, to uh, position me at the very center of the fractious uh, societal debate over human-caused climate change. But with the hockey stick, you didn't need to understand the complex workings of the climate system, how a climate model works, um, how the greenhouse effect works, to understand what the curve is telling us, that there is something unprecedented taking place today with our climate, um, and it probably isn't a coincidence that it coincides with the rapid rise in carbon dioxide concentrations associated with the burning of fossil fuels. And because of that, it, it represented a threat to um, you know, certain powerful special interests who don't want to see us transition away from fossil fuels. They're pretty happy with um, our addiction, as uh, former President George W. Bush uh, referred to it, our addiction to fossil fuels. And they didn't want to see that change. Um, 
So the hockey stick really represented a threat because it was this icon in the climate change debate. It was easily understandable. You could just look at it and see that we have a problem on our hands. And because of that, I found myself in an entirely different world from the world that a scientific training uh, prepares you to be in. I found myself um, at the center, again, of this fractious debate over human-caused climate change. Um, and uh, while it isn't sort of the, uh, the career path that I had set out on, um, uh, and it wasn't how I saw you know, myself, uh, it wasn't the way that I saw myself spending my scientific career. I figured I would spend my career um, doing what I love doing, which is working on interesting problems um, in my office, on a computer, analyzing data. This is the stuff that got me excited about science, and it's the reason that I went into this field. Uh, but with the publication of the hockey stick, whether I liked it or not, um, I was going to be at the center of the political debate over climate change. And I've ultimately embraced that role. Um, in retrospect, I can't imagine a more important uh, undertaking and a more important um, thing to be devoting your life to than trying to inform this conversation over what may be the greatest threat we face um, as a civilization, uh, the, the threat of human-caused climate change. So um, today, uh, I still do science, I still publish um, in the peer-reviewed literature, I still present at meetings, uh, but I spend a lot of my time in public outreach and communication, trying to communicate the science and its implications to the public. And again, I can't think of anything better to be spending my time doing than just that. Uh, so I don't regret the, you know, the, the path that I set out on despite the, uh, the uh, arrows um, uh, that have come my way and the efforts to discredit me. Um, frankly, uh, the efforts to attack my work and to attack me have given me um, a far more prominent position in the public discourse than I otherwise would have had, um, and it's allowed me to have a much uh, greater level of participation in, in this very important conversation. So um, well, that's the story of the hockey stick, and if you want the full story, of course, you can read my book, <laughs> The Hockey Stick and the Climate Wars. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for being courageous. Okay, now this is round two. So I, the uh, sports you know, time to answer is shorter, you gotta go out to the public, but, um, and no more pictures, by the way, so these are just direct questions. So I'm gonna go back to Dr. Evans. So many people around the world love beaches and coastlines, and many people live along coastlines. So you have a lot of rapid development around coastlines. My question is, do you think that those communities will be more susceptible or I don't know, through engineering, better buildings, they'll be more resilient to landfalling hurricanes in the future. I think it's going to work both ways. Um, if you look at Florida from Hurricane Andrew in 1992 to present, the building codes there are incredible. So people are much safer. In fact, if you're expecting a Category 3 hurricane, they say stay in your home unless you're in the flood zone. So it's hide from the wind and run from the water. Now, as Shridhar talked about, as we're warming, our sea level rising means that that flood zone where the water is piled up on the land in a storm surge as a result of that hurricane approaching, and the hurricane doesn't even have to come onto the land for that water to have a big impact. That's going to affect more and more people. <coughs> so I think, yes, that storm surge is going to have an increased impact. And one of our colleagues, Dave Titley, who's a retired rear admiral, talks about the problems that sea level rise is going to have specifically for the Navy, since, of course, almost all of the Navy's infrastructure is at sea level. And so increasing flooding of naval bases is also going to be a challenge for the US and, and also around the world. 
Um, one more thing is we have countries that are incredibly susceptible even today. So Bangladesh, for example. Uh, Bangladesh is a river delta, right? So in 1970, a tropical cyclone came ashore in Bangladesh and an estimated 300,000 people died. In 1990, another storm came ashore and only, trust me, I don't mean that really, 100,000 people died. So, so countries like that are incredibly susceptible and will become more susceptible. And we can't get away with that unless we can, I don't know, move people away from the area. But then where are they going to go to get the food, you know, to raise food for <coughs> their families? It's not a simple problem. I'm going to follow it with Shrida. So, a guy approaches me. He says, look, I've got some great beachfront property for, for you. And I'm saying, hey, I can build intergenerational wealth. So, I need to consult with you. Um, what do you think about this property in the year 2100? Well, it's in Jersey Shore, you're all right. <laughs> um, uh, so, uh, the rate of sea level rise right now is um, sort of a, uh, it, it, it's management. It's uh, something like uh, a foot a century. So, you know, something that, that we can build for, we can build levees for, we can build sea walls for in a lot of places. We've got resources uh, in Europe, in America, uh, some of the developed countries, as, as Jenny just said, in poorer countries or in island nations that just simply not possible. Uh, the worry is that this steady sea level rise that we've been observing for the last uh, sort of 50 years or so uh, may not be the story for the next 50 years or so. That many places in the Antarctic are at a very critical tipping point where uh, the sea level rise could accelerate very rapidly to instead of being a foot over the next 100 years, be three or five or six feet over the next 100 years. And then to build structures to protect your fancy new house that you just bought, Greg, uh, would the, the cost uh, to build something goes up uh, uh, it doesn't, if you build something a foot high and then you say, no, I'm just going to add another foot to it, it doesn't cost twice as much, it costs four times as much. And if you want to go from a foot to two feet to three feet, it doesn't cost three times as much, it might cost nine or ten times as much. So the cost goes up much more rapidly as, uh, as the, the size of your protection needs to go up. Uh, and then on top of that, the more rapidly you have to build these things, if you have 100 or 200 or 500 years to plan this, it doesn't cost as much as, oh dear, we need to build this in the next 10 years. Okay. Dr. Washington, you have great grandchildren. When you think about them, what comes to mind with anthropogenic climate change as they, as they become adults then? Well, I, I'm obviously very concerned about it because I have 16 grandchildren and five great grandchildren, and and they're going to be dealing with this problem of climate change in a way that is very unfortunate. <clears throat> Just adapting to it is not possible. lifestyle of people. And we're not doing the right sort of things even now. For example, uh, there are places on the coast, you know, on the Gulf Coast, that are flooding about every three or four years, and even more frequently <coughs> than that. And we, instead of telling people, you can't build here anymore, you, you, you need to move to, to another place. Government really hasn't come to that point very much. <clears throat> and we give them money to rebuild, but why? Um, we should have them with 
certain incentives moving elsewhere to higher ground. I just want to put out another important development that, that a lot of the average citizens don't understand, and that is every four years, four or five years, we get something called the National Climate Assessment. And what this is is basically an assessment of what we've learned in that three or four years that we didn't know before, or we have to have better estimates of how changes take place. And then we translate that into documents and internet cap capability, which will tell uh, city planners, state planners, <coughs> and average citizens what to expect in their location. And that will <clears throat> translate the scientific findings into something that people can actually use in making <coughs> decisions and hopefully cause less harm uh, if people are informed that they can't do certain things because of the changing climate. They can be warned about those. Numbers and the statistics that are coming out of our studies will help, help make that more accurate every four years. And it's based upon the information that we've recently gathered in the, in the previous four or five years. So I think that the government, in spite of the, well, of, of what this administration is trying to do, uh, you know, or to try to anticipate what climate change really means to the average person and, and the average business. Okay, Dr. Mann, I'm coming at you with two questions as we go and transition from the second to last round, third round. Okay. Mike, it seems that extremes are increasing, such as heat waves, floods, fire winds. Does the observational record support the fact that the assertion that these extremes are increasing? And do you think that anthropogenic climate change is adding fuel to the fire? Yeah, and, and literally, in the case of the wildfires that we've seen uh, break out across the northern hemisphere this summer, uh, I have been widely quoted as saying uh, that uh, this is the face of climate change, what we've seen play out this summer. Uh, the extreme weather events from the wildfires to unprecedented heat waves, floods, and droughts. Now, some of this, you know, Warren and the work that he was doing uh, and other scientists were doing decades ago, we predicted this. We're seeing our predictions come true, is what we're seeing play out now. Uh, long ago, uh, it was, in fact, you don't need a climate model, um, just some simple physical reasoning. If you warm the planet, you're going to have more frequent and intense heat waves. And in fact, the frequency of these heat waves can increase dramatically with even a modest amount of warming, like the degree Celsius warming we've seen with the planet over the past century. Um, but you also warm the atmosphere. Uh, a warmer atmosphere can hold more moisture. Harvey was the biggest flooding event on record. Um, and the sea surface temperatures in the Gulf of Mexico were near record levels. That means there was near record moisture in the atmosphere. But there was another ingredient, that storm stalled and it stayed over Houston uh, for a number of days. Um, there may be a climate change component to that as well, but I'll come back to that in a moment. Warmer atmosphere, more moisture, so you can get bigger flooding events. And we're seeing record flooding events uh, in Japan as well this summer. Um, a warmer uh, ground, you warm up uh, the, um, you know, the, the land surface, um, you're going to evaporate more moisture from the land, so you get worse droughts. Um, you get worse heat waves, more intense heat, and, and drought. Um, again, this isn't rocket science. You put those things together, you have the ingredients for unprecedented wildfires, as we saw play out this summer, the worst wildfire on record in California. And what disturbs me more than the fact that the worst wildfire in California happened this summer is the fact that the second worst wildfire in California history happened last winter. That's not the fire season. California may no longer have a fire season. 
It may have a perpetual fire season. Uh, Governor Jerry Brown, who's a friend of mine, has called it a new normal, but that's wrong. I've contested that sort of framing, because a new normal sounds like you've arrived in a new location and you just need to figure out how to adapt to that location. But that's not what's happening. We have an ever-shifting baseline. Um, we will see more extreme droughts, more extreme rainfall events and flooding events, more extreme heat waves and wildfires if we continue on the course that we're on. And let me finally add that there's one other ingredient that I alluded to, um, which we know played out this summer, and in fact it has played out with um, the most destructive extreme summer weather events of the past decade and a half have been associated with a behavior of the jet stream, um, and there's a fancy term for this that we call uh, planetary wave resonance, but basically under certain circumstances, and this is actually favored by a warming Arctic, when you melt the Arctic sea ice as we're seeing and you warm up the Arctic more than the rest of the planet and you change the temperature contrast from the equator to the polar regions, you change the jet stream. And you may change the jet stream in a way that you get larger meanders, so you get bigger weather events. When you see large wiggles in the jet stream, that means you're getting really unusual weather at the peaks and troughs of those waves. Um, and they remain stationary. They don't move. And when you have anomalous weather, uh, a low pressure system in the same location day after day after day, you get unprecedented flooding like we saw in Houston. You get a high pressure system day after day, week after week, like we've seen over the western U.S., like we've seen up in the Arctic uh, this summer. You get unprecedented heat and drought and wildfire. And our own work, um, in fact, some embargoed work that will uh, be coming out um, sometime within the next month, um, uh, we've actually uh, demonstrated that uh, climate change is impacting um, these jet stream uh, dynamics, this jet stream behavior in a way that's leading to these more extreme, persistent summer weather events. And so I don't think there's any question at all that we can see the human hand in the unprecedented summer weather events we've seen this summer. Okay, let me come back with you third round, last round, then we go to the public. Um, this is a question. So do you think, in your opinion, that we can avoid dangerous climate change uh, now that the U.S. has pulled out of the Paris Climate Agreement, or what do we need to do to make this, this thing happen, to, get, to stay away from dangerous climate change? So this was for me? Uh, it's for you. Okay. Um, well, you know, if you're Puerto Rico, you've seen dangerous climate change. If you're California, you've seen dangerous climate change. If you're Miami Beach, you've seen dangerous climate change. If you're Oklahoma or Texas, you've seen dangerous climate change. If you're Scandinavia, you've seen dangerous climate change. If you're Portugal, you've seen dangerous climate change. If you're Greece, you've seen dangerous climate change. Dangerous climate change has arrived by any reasonable definition catastrophic impacts um, that are playing out in real time, devastation that plays out on our television screens. It's here, it's arrived. The question isn't, can we avoid dangerous climate change? It's, can we avoid the most dangerous climate change? Can we avoid truly catastrophic and irreversible changes in our climate? And many of the scientists, many of our colleagues who study the impacts of climate change, have sort of centered on a number of about uh, two degrees Celsius warming of the planet, that's about three and a half degrees Fahrenheit warming of the planet, um, where we will see the most uh, severe impacts of climate change, where we'll see massive sea level rise, where we will see um, far worse droughts and heat waves, um, and that can still be avoided. In fact, we published some work um, within the last year uh, demonstrating that um, you know there is still a budget, there's still a certain amount of carbon that we can afford to burn and avoid crossing that two degree dangerous threshold. Uh, but that is becoming increasingly difficult with each year where we don't see the reductions that we need to see. Um, there's a, uh, a famous plot that shows how we would have had to decrease our carbon emissions if we had started two decades ago. And it's a bunny slope. Um, it's, it's a ski slope that I can uh, ski down. <coughs> what two decades of inaction has bought us now instead is a trip down a double diamond slope. Um, that's what we're dealing with. We have to reduce our carbon emissions far more dramatically because of decades of relative inaction. Um, 
Paris, if all the countries of the world make good on their commitments to the Paris Agreement, that gets us about halfway there. It doesn't get us the uh, reductions that we need to avoid dangerous to the warming, it gets us about halfway there. What that means is that all the countries of the world need to meet their Paris obligations, and then we have to ratchet them up in the next major conference. Um, and, you know, the U.S. now is the skunk at the garden party, is the only country that now is uh, unwilling to make uh, good on its commitments to Paris under Trump. That's the bad news. The good news is it actually doesn't matter what Trump does. Um, it turns out that it, the uh, actions that uh, Warren was uh, alluded, alluding to at the local level, at the state level, and consortiums of states and what companies are doing, um, if you tally up the progress that we're seeing right now, um, even in the absence of uh, sort of uh, any uh, support for climate action at the executive level or even at the congressional level, um, we will probably make good on our commitments to Paris. <coughs> whether or not Trump nominally claims to uh, want to pull out of uh, Paris. But again, we have to improve on those commitments. Uh, it isn't enough to just make good on our Paris commitments. That means we do need leadership at the congressional level. Um, in you know, about 70 days, um, you have an opportunity um, here in Pennsylvania um, to send a message to Congress. If you don't like a, the policy of inaction on climate, that we've seen under the current Congress working hand in hand with the current administration, we have an opportunity to, to make our voices heard and, and, and to signal that we want to go in a different direction. And I'll leave it on that note. Thank you. All right, thanks. Okay. Dr. Evans, where are the knowledge gaps in the science of hurricanes? Where do we have to improve? before the next hurricane strikes next week. <laughs> it depends on what you want. If you want to improve the forecasting, the answer goes one way. If you want to improve understanding how they interact with the climate, it actually might go a different direction. So if you want to improve the forecast of something that's coming ashore in the next couple of weeks, maybe for Florence, who knows, um, you want to understand how the structure evolves as much as how the track evolves. So we forecast the intensity. We don't forecast it as well as we should. Over the last three decades, our forecasting of track has improved enormously. Um, since the mid-90s to now, what used to be the accuracy of the one-day forecast is now the accuracy <coughs> of the three to four day forecast. So we have two or more extra days to get out of the way with the same amount of, of accuracy. That's a fantastic achievement and it's come from a lot of people uh, developing better and better climate models and, and weather forecast models and it's come from people developing new instrumentation and new technologies and from better understanding through improved theory that have helped along by all of that. So we can do the track much better, but we can't do the intensity so well. So if I'm worried about a storm coming ashore, I care about what the strongest winds could be. And if we're looking at those, those forecast models, we need to improve. Remember I said that the engine of that storm is the clouds around the storm? We need to improve how we simulate that engine to give us a better understanding of intensity. But again, if you look at a hurricane coming ashore, very few people are affected by the eye itself. So the most intense winds affect a very small number of people. The structure of the hurricane, how big it is, how circular or not it is, uh, affects the sort of weather people get and you can be quite far from a storm, or you can be in a weak storm and get the kinds of flooding. Maybe not that we saw in Harvey, but Tropical Storm Allison was a massive flooding event in um, Florida, Panhandle, <coughs> Alabama. Um, so understanding that structure is something we don't do very well yet. And that's something that my group, among others, has been working on because that structure is critical to telling 
everybody in the path of the storm what they might expect, not just <coughs> the people who are in the path of the eye have a lot to worry about, but there could be people far from that that have a lot to worry about. Just very quickly on the climate, what we need to understand is how hurricanes affect the mixing of warm water in the ocean. So are they having a significant contribution to mixing that warm water down into the ocean or not? And we don't know that. Okay, thank you. Uh, <coughs> Dr. Washington, your last question. Uh, what are the greatest challenges in climate models today? Is it getting more computing power or is it understanding processes better or coupling with which are <clears throat> there is there's continued in, improvement in climate models every few years. Um, if you, in order to answer your question, I think it's where we're sort of moving to, and that is to not specify carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases in our models, but to actually calculate those. And it involves very complicated uh, treatment of aerosols and feedback of aerosols with the clouds. And so this is going to be an area of, of great intensity to understand and to make it really work properly in the, in the models. We need certain observations that we only have a limited set of, of observations from now. I, I think help is on the way in the, in the new plans for satellites that measure the, the ingredients in the atmosphere and the oceans, we can actually get answers to these questions and, and then, then sort of improve our modeling as a function of, of the observations that we see. <clears throat> Just keep in mind that climate models are, th are theoretical models. In order to check that the models are doing the right thing, we spend a lot of our time analyzing the observations and the, the, the uh, models to see where we have biases and, and a need for improvement. And, and then I would say that, that our, our <coughs> modelers are working very closely to the observational part of the, of the scientists. So that Making progress. Okay, Ice, your last. <laughs> so, is there a simple way, or any known way, to stop an ice sheet from collapsing once it becomes uh, unstable? Are there geoengineering solutions to this problem? <laughs> Answer is no. <laughs> Move in and what? Get away from. Uh, so, uh, geoengineering is, is the is the uh, attempt to try and modify Earth processes by, uh, for example, you want to reduce the amount of sunshine you're getting. You throw up uh, reflective foil or something like that. So the question is, uh, you've got a glacier, it's, uh, it's heading towards the ocean in Antarctica. Is there something you can do to stabilize it? Is there something you can do to keep it from melting? Uh, and, you know, the Earth system is very, very complex, and we all understand that. But we also understand that you take a chunk of ice and you make it warmer, it's going to melt. Uh, <laughs> there is just no two ways around that. Uh, you can, you can delay it maybe a little bit with an enormous effort. Uh, um, and, and so if you're going to talk about geoengineering, you should talk about it at very local, very small scale. So for example, in the mountains of the Himalayas, there's, uh, in the Himalayan mountains, there's many small communities that depend on uh, runoff from melting glaciers uh, that uh, provide them with a steady uh, supply of water through months when maybe there's no rainfall, but the streams are still running because the glaciers, and those glaciers are going white, they're getting smaller, and, and so the supply of water for some of these communities is being reduced. Um, and so perhaps that's, 
an area you could think about making sort of artificial glaciers or, or trying to, to, to preserve the ability of, of these areas to maintain water uh, by pumping. And, and some small communities do that where they pump water into ponds and let them freeze in the, in the winter. So when they have excess water available, they try and sequester it, let it freeze, and then, and then it melts out. So they, they're making their own little glacier. And those are the kinds of things that that can, can be effective as stopgap measures, but, well. Okay, your, your bad news. Yeah. <laughs> so so you yeah. told me, don't answer the guy's call uh, for the house. Uh, Move to the next <laughs> room. <laughs> okay, we're going to take this out to the public. I'm going to put the mic here. So if you want to ask questions, please come up. Um, state your name and uh, ask the question. Hello, uh, uh, my name is Anaita and I'm a graduate student over in Ag and Biological Engineering. And my question is, um, do you think that the disconnect in communicating like the science of climate change to public is, is politically driven primarily? Or are we as scientists missing something and doing something wrong? And if so, uh, what should we be doing to get the word out there and get people involved? Well, first of all, vote. <laughs> <laughs> I think that we need to change the direction that things are going in, in right now. And just remember, if you are going to vote, you're voting not only for yourself, but your family, and your children, and everyone else that, that's going to be affected <coughs> by climate change. I'm happy to add some thoughts uh, as well. Um, you know, there's a, a famous uh, saying. Uh, attributed to Upton Sinclair. Um, it's very difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends on him not understanding it. And I think that's probably a good sort of subtext for understanding um, the remarkable gulf that exists um, between where the scientific community is, where, depending on how you measure it, uh, 97 to 99.9% .9 a degree of consensus among the world's scientists that climate change is real, human-caused, and already a problem. And yet, if you look at public opinion, um, uh, there's only maybe a 60 to 70 percent uh, support uh, for that conclusion um, when you poll the American people on that. And then if you look at the current congressional leadership, the majority are climate change deniers. Now, why is that? Um, it's not that they're not well-educated. Congress is made up of some of the best educated people. Um, it comes back to the Upton Sinclair quote. And so, unfortunately, um, while there's a good faith political debate to be had about what we do to tackle this problem, and there's a role for people of all ideologies in that debate, there is no longer a good faith debate to be had about whether climate change is real, human caused, or a problem. And as Warren said, and as I said earlier as well, um, the only way we're going to see a change in, say, the stance of our Congress when it comes to uh, the scientific evidence for climate change is to elect politicians who are willing to act on our behalf um, instead of acting on the behalf of special interests who too often fund their campaigns. I want to take a slightly different tack. I don't disagree with what's been said, but I think in that these discussions have talked about the public debate on climate change. There's been a lot of research in science communication done that talks about how people are much more receptive to information that's going to sway their ideas and inform them about different um, arguments than they thought about. <coughs> The person telling you 
should look as much like yourself as possible. So if you want someone to, to learn more about what's happening and what the understanding is in climate change, we need an increasingly diverse group of people talking about climate change. Warren spent his entire career trying to increase diversity and many in this room have also been working on that. But we need people who are politically diverse, diverse in religion, in culture, in background, in all kinds of different ways. And that will help get the word out in ways that people will be receptive to. <coughs> Um, I'm not going to let the, boss, the scientists off the hook. I think we have not been uh, as good communicators of our science. Uh, our natural tendency is to hum and to awe and to qualify and to add all sorts of adjectives to everything that we say, uh, which might be appropriate uh, in some circumstances, but there are other times that, that I think we could be more direct and simpler uh, in our language. And so I, I think that is an important skill and it's a learned skill. It's not it, it, it's not something any of us are, are very good at because we're trained in a very different way. Hi, uh, my name is David and I'm a chemical engineering PhD student here at Penn State. Uh, my question to you all is maybe maybe stepping back from the 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 um, I guess, the public debate about this. Uh, do you guys see any effect, I guess, from uh, public discourse, uh, government-wise, et cetera, uh, on, on the research you do? Is, is that, is there any effect from that, um, negative or positive? Uh, um, Yeah. yeah. Fortunately, I see, I've seen no pushback at all on my research. Um, I've been very fortunate, and no, I'm just kidding, of course. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting. Um, we could all talk about the really interesting debates that exist within the science, uh, because we spend most of our time debating and disagreeing and arguing with other scientists. That's how science <coughs> works. And, uh, at the beginning of this event, we were wondering about, you know, would there be any skeptics in the audience? And, and I said, well, I hope, uh, you know, everybody in the audience is skeptics. We should all be skeptics, um, but real skeptics, which is to say, you know, uh, in, in, in the, the terms that Carl Sagan famously framed uh, skepticism, um, that, uh, you know, the, the, the more, um, you know, extraordinary the claim, the more extraordinary the evidence must be. And I'll tell you, the extraordinary claim today would be the claim that despite the fundamental nature of the greenhouse effect and the fact that we have now increased the concentration of these greenhouse gases by uh, more than 50%, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, what we wouldn't be able to explain, given the physics, the radiative physics and the chemistry and our understanding of the basics would be if the planet weren't warming up and if the ice weren't melting and if sea level weren't rising. So when somebody claims to be a skeptic and yet they're asserting that the world scientific community is wrong and, and, and they're right um, and they're contesting you know, the, the fundamental physics of the problem, a true skeptic should recognize that that's an extraordinary claim that you've just leveled, and your evidence ain't that extraordinary. Um, it's a blog post that you pointed me to. Um, so uh, I think it's important for the public to understand that scientists are skeptical, and that we spend most of our time at the forefront of the science, the things that we don't know, trying to figure out the answers to things we don't understand, debating them in the peer-reviewed literature and at meetings. Um, and we could have a really interesting discussion here about uh, the impact of climate change on hurricanes and, and tornadoes and, um, and the uncertainty and ice sheet dynamics, which is huge, but uncertainty isn't our friend. 
because maybe we'll be really lucky and we'll be at the low end of the uncertainty range, but increasingly, as the evidence comes in, it seems like we're more likely to be at the high end of the uncertainty range. Um, so I do think it's important for the public to understand that scientists are intrinsically skeptical and, and we do debate the specifics, but there's no debate about the greenhouse effect. There's no debate about the fact that the Earth is warming up and that we're responsible for it. And there's no debate about the fact that the impacts of climate change are no longer subtle. Um, there is debate about some of the details. How bad will it be? How much worse will Atlantic hurricanes get? Um, so it's important to keep that in mind. There is uncertainty. Scientists spend most of their careers exploring uncertainty. And we don't spend all of our time reiterating what's already known. But when it comes to the public discourse, it's really important to reiterate what's already known. Because that's really the, the take home message for the public. I think another thing to think about is how policies in government agencies might change our opportunity. And maybe that's what you were talking about, either to do science or to advise on scientific findings. For example, in the EPA at the moment, they're arguing that anyone with a vested interest in the discussion, meaning scientists who've had EPA funding, should not be on advisory committees for the EPA. <coughs> and that all evidence should be traceable. Now, that's, that sounds really like the way it should happen, right? But if you've got a study of a, you know, a health study, on the impacts of microparticles in the air in a building, then people who have signed on to that study have asked to, for confidentiality. Now, if you can't, according to the argument that everything should be public, you should be naming the individuals and what their information <coughs> is. And you wouldn't be getting people in that study if you did that, yet the overall findings of the study have strong evidential um, information behind them. So in that way, we are having issues with the sort of science we can do and the impact that science can have. And I think that that is really, really disturbing. It's fact, like here from Dr. Washington, we've seen the ebb and flow of many types of philosophies in government and where we are today. I guess I'm, I'm kind of awkward in that I served under Republican and Democratic administrations. Uh, and I think that uh, the progress that's been made seems to be neglected now. And, and I'm afraid if it goes on for too long, it's going to affect future generations of scientists and that they won't be able to support themselves if they if they can't get funding for their research. And I worry about that. <coughs> now there is, uh, if I could just say one thing about geoengineering. Uh, my colleague takes a sort of a dim view of it, but I'm, <coughs> I'm a sort of the monitor for, for one of the major studies that are taking place about taking carbon dioxide out of, out of the atmosphere from a smokestack and then pumping it down underground. There's some interesting research being proposed as a way to deal with, with the, the uh, direct effect of, of, of carbon dioxide going into the atmosphere. Now, the problem with it is basically it's going to take probably decades to get this technology to work properly. And we're going to lose more time. And so it's not a savior from uh, all the things that you heard from the speakers here. We still need to, con to conserve. That's the biggest improvement in, 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 in dealing with uh, emissions of, 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 of gases from fossil fuel, so as to cut back on our use of fossil fuels. So renewable energy sources such as solar and, 
and uh, uh, wind power should be adopted more and, to, and, and with <coughs> sort of uh, inducements by the government to, to really push that. So there are, are a lot of solutions going on, but they're still not going to save us. I mean, we really have to deal with the, the reduction of burning the fossil fuels. Thank you. I wanted, to, I wanted to follow up on what Jenny said. So, how do you turn an opponent into a proponent? And I've, I've here, try this. Sounds okay. like you have some ideas. Okay, so every time you go to the gas pump, 3%, pick a number, could be 3, 1, 2, 5, of that money is required to be spent by the people that sold you that gas on green energy. Okay, so the biggest constraint about using, say, wind energy or solar energy is the capital cost up front. Okay. So the people that are the most opposed to it because they're taking our opportunity of selling you gas, now they become the proponents of green energy and they have a stake in it. So within 30 years, everything's green energy. I think uh, I come from Australia and Australia is known as the land of drought and flooding rains. So we need to do something about how we deal with the climate, separate from what everyone else is doing. From 2000 till 2010, Australia had what was called the big dry. A third of the country was in drought for 10 years. When you get a flooding rain, even if it's not any worse than otherwise, but you've had 10 years of dry ground, it's like concrete, and the rain runs off. So there are states in Australia that are working really hard on green energy and succeeding. So South Australia is the driest state on the driest inhabited continent, and they're now getting up to 50% of their electricity on any given day, not on every day, from renewables. Now they have a massive desert, so solar works pretty well. And they're on the Gulf, the um, Great Australian Bight, so there's <coughs> wind coming up from the Antarctic. So they're in a great place. But we have one state in Australia who has made that and made it out of necessity. And I think that we can do more with or without that kind of subsidy. I think that things are becoming <coughs> more possible. So maybe not too optimistic, but I do think we can do it without that. And I think that the force of will of people who are living through really difficult times in terms of weather and climate is going to push us over the edge. Thank you. Uh, I'm Massa, I'm also a PhD student at Tennessee. So I uh, like the idea, uh, the fact that you mentioned there are uh, people who are talking about this challenge, this new change as an opportunity, like we have new resources, and CO2 in the air is something that we should go and harvest, and we are good at, you know, getting use of all the resources. We, uh, we now have this opportunity to uh, benefit from, and this is, I think, uh, something that was missing in this conversation. Uh, we always talk about the change and the fear of, you know, unknown and how we are going to evolve, what's going to happen, we know, we know nothing, but being optimistic about how now to uh, learn or see it as an opportunity for human uh, beings or our uh, living system as a way to evolve. Uh, but there is a challenge, there is another challenge here which is, uh, you mentioned the diversity and this connection between scientists and public. Um, so that, the, again, the fear of change, I, I see that in our, ourselves as well, because 
to be wide diverse group of leaf, which are to engage like women, diverse uh, population to our academic environment. But the system itself is so uh, hard, you know, it changes you and it's really doing a good job in making us really like each other, the language, the way we talk. Uh, so innovation in a system that is so fixed, it's hard, and, and also the, the fact about the fundings and how I have been working here on research projects, but the fact that it's just, the system makes it so hard for you to have that freedom of thinking. Your everyday you know, life is dependent on that resource, that money, that deliverable. It, there is not much room uh, for you to be creative about your solution. Do you have any, um, maybe observation or any suggestion on how to be a change agent in this really fixated uh, system that we have defined and we are living in. I'm going to defer to Warren first because he has the longest record of, of being an agent of change. <laughs> well, so this has worried me as well. And um, Fred said, um, next year I'll be president of the American Meteorological Society. And when I was asked to think about doing this, to go for being elected, I started to think about why would I do it and what would I want to do. And one of the things that I came up with was absolutely to try and think about how we can increase the diversity in our community um, to increase it because it seems like, you know, you get different people in the room coming from a different background, you look at something in a different way. And maybe that's the way we should think about it in that situation. So, uh, we have another colleague who's amazing in terms of diversity, Jose Fuentes, and he's at the moment advising the National Science Foundation on how to do diversity better. So when you've got an expert in the office next door, you tap him, and so I've asked Jose to help me. And what we're trying to do is to bring together very junior scientists uh, and very senior scientists with the idea that we have tried earnestly to improve things over the last few decades, and in our society, we haven't done as well as we would like to do. And so maybe the junior scientists have ideas we haven't thought about, and the senior scientists have the contacts. <laughs> and so we can try and make change by pairing those two groups together. So I'll let you know in a couple of years if we manage to do anything to advance things further. But that's, that's the current try. Can I just say one, one thing? This is more of a, not, not so much on the human uh, capital, if you will, but uh, change brings opportunity. So for example, uh, People mentioned solar and wind. Uh, those are very viable technologies, and there is money to be made, profit to be made, innovation to be to be done uh, that can uh, kind of move from the horse and buggy to the car, and people make money. But even though some people lose money on the horse and buggy, now other people make money on the car. And and the greatest opportunities in developing countries that don't have a uh, well-established infrastructure of power grids and this and that. Now maybe we can take all of our technology of miniaturization and, and, and smart small systems and start moving them out into the community. So I think there's enormous opportunity out there, uh, and and I think there's people who uh, can take advantage of it if some of these structural issues that we've talked about are. We've got about seven minutes or eight minutes left, so make your questions quick and the answers quick. And you make your questions and answers quick. Okay, the answers. Okay, I'll try. <laughs> uh, so I'm Anil Gurkarni, I'm a, a faculty member in mechanical engineering here at Penn State. I have a question about the um, impact of our diet on climate change or factors contributing to climate change. So I'm told that, oh, I'm right, that an average person in the world today consumes about 90 pounds of meat per year. Although 
there is, it seems like a bimodal distribution. There is a good 10 to 15 percent population consumes one tenth or less than that. What should we know? Uh, we, can, we call them vegetarians. So, a typical person versus a vegetarian, do they have any uh, significant impact in, on climate change? And if so, roughly by how much? I don't know if you can tell. And uh, whether <clears throat> a small behavioral change, not very really drastic, can make measurable climate change. So this, there's been a lot of discussion about this uh, issue recently. You know, uh, what contribution can sort of dietary changes make to uh, reducing our carbon emissions? And unfortunately, there's a lot of misinformation out there as well. There was a, uh, a highly publicized film, uh, some of you may have seen it, Cowspiracy, Cowspiracy, that uh, conveyed um, just erroneous um, numbers uh, and claiming that the 50, more than 50% of our carbon emissions is from eating meat. Um, the reality is that uh, the vast majority, uh, roughly 70% of our carbon emissions comes from um, burning of fossil fuels for energy transportation. Um, and agriculture, farming, livestock, uh, somewhere in the range of 20% or so. And the opportunity to reduce that um, is maybe in the range of, um, in, in terms of diet, uh, you know, we can reduce our carbon emissions um, from, from, from our dietary uh, sort of practices um, by, you know, maybe 30% by going from, say, a, a meat-heavy diet to a vegan diet. So that's a pretty big chunk, and it is something that anybody can do, and it's very empowering. And I, I don't eat meat, and I feel good about that choice. Um, and it does decrease my carbon emissions, and I do other things to do that as well. But if we are to see the sorts of reductions that are going to be necessary to avoid catastrophic warming of the planet, those sorts of voluntary measures aren't going to cut it. Uh, we should all do those things. We call these no regrets, um, things that we can do in our everyday lives that make us healthier and happier, and they save us money. Um, and we ought to do them anyways. But if we're going to see the sorts of reductions that um, are required, which is you know, beyond Paris uh, level commitments, then we need a price on carbon. We need to put a price on the burning of fossil fuels. And so to me, when people ask, what's the most important thing that I can do? Well, yeah, dietary practices and other voluntary practices, it's important to do those things. But probably the most important thing you can do is contribute to collective pressure on our policymakers to act on this problem, to help us incentivize a shift away from the burning of fossil fuels toward renewable energy. Thank you. What? That's a nice I don't have anything to add. I just think that uh, that we can do something, and we can do it among ourselves, but to really turn the country around, we have to we have to make drastic changes, not something that's at the, at the 5 or 10 percent level. Right. Uh, Bernhard College of Government and Sciences. Uh, one point to make, I think what would help everyone is to conserve not only energy, but our resources in general. For example, water, everything we have. Um, one question is, what I miss here, I'm constantly remodeling our house, for example, is technology. I grew up in northern Germany. I have a lot of friends from the Netherlands. There's technology like smart windows, certain types of insulations, and stuff is available that I can't get here. So. How do we change that? And the other question is, um, when I, whenever I fly over like the Netherlands or this, this kind of area, flatlands, the open ocean there, I see, uh, see thousands of those windmills, turbines that generate energy. Um, what I find a little bit disturbing right now is I like the idea of using renewable energies, 
but there are more and more studies coming out that they are changing our climates, and they're kind of being picked up by the climate deniers. So how can we counterbalance this? That we really stay on track and still want to use renewable energies and not being so addicted to fossil fuels. Even though there are these countless studies are out there saying the windmill or thousands of windmills change our climate, change our wind patterns. What do we do about that? I can, uh, sure, I mean, there, there have been studies of, you know, what's the impact if, uh, you know, massive installation of uh, wind turbines. And it, it's pretty minimal, um, actually. Uh, and what I find is many of the criticisms uh, when it comes to uh, renewable energy, um, you know, you hear uh, criticisms uh, of the bird catch uh, from, from wind turbines. Um, from people who I, I'm just not convinced actually care at all about the birds, um, but are looking for some convenient, you know, uh, excuse for for sort of throwing cold water on renewable energy. A lot of the groups that um, that have attacked uh, renewable energy, that have run campaigns against re the renew renewable energy industry, are linked to groups like Alec and the Koch brothers, um, the fossil fuel industry. It's not a coincidence. Um, you know, when it comes to birds, who I trust the Audubon Society. And what does the Audubon Society say? They say that the biggest threat to birds and other animals is, is human-caused climate change. Um, and, and they support the move to renewable energy. You hear similar arguments about uh, mercury um, from, uh, you know, from so, so the manufacturing of solar panels. Uh, again, you know, everything we do leaves an environmental footprint. Um, and I liked the point that you made about uh, conservation and efficiency um, and, and reducing our use of resources. Um, that's really important. Uh, you know, the, 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 the biggest thing we can do here is to reduce our use of natural resources. Um, but that having been said, we, we need a certain amount of energy. You know, we need to keep the lights on. Um, and so it, it, conservation, actually California, a large part of what's allowed them to cut their carbon emissions has been increased energy efficiency. And the governor has supported measures to increase energy efficiency. There's a lot that can be done there. Um, but we're going to need to move to renewable energy. And we are going to need to, um, to recognize that along the way, there are going to be bad actors who are going to go down kicking and screaming. Uh, they don't want a clean, smooth transition away from fossil fuels. They're benefiting quite well from our burning of fossil fuels. And we have to recognize that there is a certain amount of bad faith in our public discourse because of that. And we have to be willing to call out bad actors when, when, when it's necessary. Thanks, Okay, we have the last two questions. Our young people, please ask the questions. Uh, I'm a doctoral student in the plant biology program here at Penn State. A lot of research is currently being conducted on um, altering or engineering our crops in uh, anticipation for the effects of climate change. What's your opinion on this, and uh, what do you think we should be doing uh, in preparation for the effects of severe environmental and weather phenomena? So the integrated network of food, energy, and water, and I would argue health, is something that the National Science Foundation has been inspiring us to think about. And I think that, um, that it's put together some really interesting partnerships. I'm in a, a grant from that jointly with um, engineers, with, so we're the weather and climate people here, and then with people making computer games and with psychologists and with energy experts and with sociologists. And what we're trying to look at is how can you change people's perspective on what they're doing that's impacting the climate system by giving them very realistic estimates of how they fit into uh, the emissions profile and then giving them the, the guys in Arizona are building a computer game. So you can say, okay, this is what I do. Now, if I change this process, how is that going to impact how I contribute to the emissions on the planet? And, and also in that is how the agriculture, so 
possible agriculture, what would happen to agriculture as the climate changes, about agriculture practices and food miles and so on. And so I think that giving people this holistic uh, perspective on the world as they live it is going to help us make those decisions about agriculture and, and energy and, and the, whether things are more local or distributed. I'd like to end on an optimistic note and um, ask you um, what kind of private enterprise or grassroots organizations have you heard of or that you know of that are making a positive influence on the environment, their local communities, and yeah, that could be helpful. I'll jump in with one which I'm a great fan of because I'm an avid bicyclist. There are, and, and you all should look into it. This is Bicycles Against Poverty, so in a lot of places, uh, in Africa, one of the most, and India and other places, uh, one of the most difficult things is simply getting water or firewood or food or going to school. Uh, and and uh, bicycles are an extraordinarily good way to do that, and they are zero carbon, uh, and, and uh, they are sustainable. Uh, they build a whole industry around themselves, and people repairing them and, and improving them, things like that. So look for different uh, organizations that, that build these sturdy sort of workforce bicycles and, and, uh, and deliver them and sell them in, uh, in developing countries. That, that's well, as a, a member of their board, I would be remiss to not uh, put out a plug for Penn Future, um, which is doing a lot of great work here in Pennsylvania. They're actually affiliated with the National Wildlife uh, Foundation which uh, does similarly great work at the national level. Um, you know, the, the usual suspects um, in the climate space, uh, Sierra Club, amazing work under Michael Bruns' leadership, um, and, uh, you know, the, the Greenpeace, um, Union of Concerned Scientists, I, I love the work that they do, and each of these groups sort of does complementary work. Uh, UCS really focuses on defending uh, scientists and defending science uh, against the attacks. Um, by special interests um, and by those seeking to discredit the science. Um, Greenpeace, of course, is, uh, does sort of really uh, sort of engages in gritty uh, efforts um, to uh, sort of communicate uh, environmental threats to the public. Um, Sierra Club, again, traditionally was one of the more conservative um, non-governmental organizations, environmental organizations, and under Michael Brood's leadership has really sort of taken the lead when it comes to climate change. They have a huge membership, and importantly, getting at this issue that we were talking about before, they have a lot of, you know, historically, because they've been a conservative organization, they have a lot of people who are sort of political moderates and conservatives, and so when you can reach those folks, when you can sort of claim some of the ground that's been lost in the public debate um, by getting, you know, political moderates on board, um, conservatives, sort of old school conservatives who believe that conserving the environment is part of being conservative. Um, I think there's a real opportunity to bring those people into the fold. And each of these organizations speaks to different constituencies, um, uh, gets back to a